following is a video presentation of a worship service at Orville Baptist Church. back in the house. Glad you're all back here. Peggy, glad to see you back. Like I said, I was wondering if I was going to have to come pick you up and drag you back over here, but we're glad to have you. I'm glad you're doing better, too. And uh, same thing with everybody else. Hope everybody else is uh, doing as well as, as they can be, too. I do have a few announcements. Um, last week I did um, present to you that the, the mission teams needed to uh, rotate off. Um, I did make a mistake there. There were three teams uh, when the, uh, in their constitution when this was laid out. Um, so it's been two years, but instead of having uh, in the first rotation year, having everybody rota rotate off the church council, it was decided there would be a, uh, three people would rotate off and three people would serve a three year term. So I just want to update that to everyone. And we do have our new uh, team mission leaders. I want to announce them at this time. Um, Ruby Manley will be over the uh, welcome team. Um, Sharon Arthur is going to be over the mission team. Um, Pam Garrison is still on the outreach team. She will be the one serving a three-year term. Um, Jimmy Waters is still on the helping team, and he will be sending a, a three-year term. Carol Gurley, who is on our prayer team, she is also serving a three-year term. And then Karen Waters is on our uh, hospitality team. So uh, we look forward for every, you know, working with everyone. And if you get a chance, after, uh, can we just meet one second down here? The church, new church council meetings after church, it won't take but about two or three minutes and uh, just to get you involved in something but those are new leaders so please please be in prayer as uh, these teams uh, go forward this year and uh, you know like I said the deacon board and I'm sure the church and everybody looks forward to working with uh, each team members and also about those team members uh, like for everybody to focus upon when they were um, first um, developed it was pushed to us to serve basically on one team and to serve what God gives us the talent to serve as. Um, try to focus on one particular item this year and I, I know you might serve on other teams and that's fine but really pick out something that you know God has laid on your heart that you know you you're that's your main focus and that's what you'd like to carry out on your team so we all got different talents we got God gives us all different things some things that I can't do somebody else can do so um, pray about that and uh, kind of concentrate that throughout the year about your mission and your teams. 
Um, also, the uh, like to uh, announce the uh, Janie Chapman offering um, that will go through uh, through September. Um, the goal is uh, nine hundred and fifty dollars. Currently, we're at five hundred and eighty-eight dollars. So, um, everybody, please uh, come and prepare to uh, participate. Um, that would greatly, uh, I'm sure Ruby would appreciate that as well as the church. Uh, also, the Linda Hawkins prayer group meeting is Monday on the 14th at 5 o'clock in the Hayes building. Um, look forward to, I know they haven't met in a while, so this will be one of their first meetings, and I know they're kind of excited about, um, you know, meeting together. Um, also, next Sunday, Cindy Carries will be uh, celebrating her mother's 90th birthday in the fellowship hall. So just want to kind of bring that up to you as well. Um, also on our prayer list, I'd like to bring up a few people that are uh, on our prayer list. And um, one of them is uh, Susan Mobley, who uh, she fell this week and bruised and kind of sore. Um, there's Patricia Davis, who's been um, diagnosed with the COVID-19. Uh, Earlene Gray and her daughter have also been diagnosed with the COVID-19 as well. So please be in prayer for these people. And, and we just, you know, we, we thank you for praying for them. Could I add a couple? Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, Y'all probably, most of you know Eddie and Patricia Kerr worked at McDougal's for all those years. Eddie's in the hospital with the COVID. His health is already very compromised. And Patricia's at home, been tested, hadn't got results, but she's probably got it too. And, you know, they both had strokes. They, they're just really in need of prayer. So, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else like to add somebody to the prayer list? Uh, okay. All right. Well, at this time, I'd like to... Uh, Recognize uh, Brother Frank. Uh, he has an update for us on the um, our pastor search team. So, uh, Frank, if you would. Good morning. Nice to be here, isn't it? Uh, last month, um, I gave you a report. <clears throat> Not much has changed, but a little has changed. <coughs> we had come down to three individuals that we thought were uh, very promising, looked very good possibilities for a pastor. One of those uh, has now been called by another church. Um, his, one of his directions of trying to come to South Carolina, Orville area, to be closer to his family, his daughter and her children, and uh, the other church um, is closer to them. Uh, so there was nothing, I asked him if there was anything in particular uh, that uh, we needed to focus on. Uh, to overcome. He said, no, it had nothing to do with Orville. It had everything to do with being close to his family. We have two gentlemen right now that are on the active consideration list. We've conducted an initial um, online interview with one of the gentlemen uh, two weeks ago, I think. And this Thursday, the second individual will be driving in and doing an in-person interview. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, both of these individuals, like I said, out of 100 and I think eight or nine, we're down to two. And uh, both of them look very promising uh, from where we stand right now. We've contacted uh, references, very strong references. So we're moving forward. Keep praying for us. We're hoping to get this done in God's perfect timing. Thank you.
may be seated. Father, we do thank you for this time that we can come into your house to worship you, the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of this world, this universe, all things on and in between, Father. And we're just so grateful for that today. As we love you today, as we know you today, it's all it's through your Son and our personal Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus' precious blood spilt through his resurrected body. And through, he sits at the right hand throne of the Almighty God that would come today to worship God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit and lift up the Trinity as one and glorify you to the fullest. Father, just be with us as we're here to gather here today to, to worship you. As we come in today, Father, with all kinds of things on our hearts, we come in here with things that, that we know that we just need to put aside and we need to point and, and listen to you for this appointed hour and to worship you and to lift you up and to glorify your name and, and, and it's all in truth and in spirit that we come here Father and we just pray that the Holy Spirit will have his way throughout this service and touch our lives and, and soften our hearts Father to be more like Jesus to come closer to him and to walk in the fullness of Jesus Father as we just worship you and praise you and, and lift it all up to you today and Father we do pray for this world that we live in Father as you have said there will be all kind of types of wars, room for wars, earthquakes, hurricanes, diseases, famines, just evilness, whether it's murder, rape, rioting, looting. Father, just so many things that we see and it's, and it's all around us. And you, you, you tell us to be cognizant of it. You tell us to be aware of it, but you tell us, Father, to, to give it to you, to, to, for us to put our trust and faith in you so we don't have to go out in this world and worry about that, Father, that you're in control. And we just lift that up to you and just honor that power and that glory that you have, Father. So, Father, be with us as we worship you through the rest of the day. Be with our pastor. He brings the message that we need to hear and apply it to our lives. Give us all a great day and we'll just give you the glory and honor for it all as we do pray in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen.
to the Lord willing uh, begin a, a series of sermons this morning uh, dealing with the seven churches of Asia Minor or the churches, seven churches of Revelation and this is all important it was certainly in the day that uh, uh, John penned these words as the Holy Spirit on the Isle of Patmos gave him uh, the words, but uh, this is uh, for us today also. Uh, it's not specifically written to us because he wrote to those churches, but it is written for us that we look at it because the same truths apply to us. And so here it is for us. And as I, this week uh, and all week uh, from last Sunday uh, through this morning actually, uh, pondering over all of the things that is in uh, these seven churches, the things that are said, uh, it just, God put in my heart uh, that when you move to a new community, and now some of you have not done that, I guess, uh, we have moved uh, in our life more times than I have stopped trying to count them up how many times. Uh, we have moved. Now we started out, our first uh, apartment was in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, right across, pretty close across from the Gator Bowl uh, area. And, uh, but anyhow, we, uh, that stadium on Highway 17 there, but it was a garage apartment, about as big as your choir loft. And we moved every earthly thing that we owned uh, when we were married in Easley, uh, we, her dad had, I didn't even have a car. Her dad gave us uh, an old Volkswagen he had. And we put every earthly thing we had in that Volkswagen and moved to Florida. Uh, we had suitcases tied on top. And going down the road, an 18-wheeler passed us. And I thought I had them really secured, but they... Uh, blew off, hit the road. Just I could see them in the mirror sliding and cars dodging them. Uh, it was given to us uh, for our one of the wedding presents from someone, uh, uh, a set of those things, and I recommend them. They're good. They didn't come apart. Uh, and, uh, but anyhow, uh, it goes on, and uh, now uh, it takes a, a full-blown 18-wheeler uh, to get all our stuff in and to move it from one place to the other. But moving, uh, I was under the conviction, even in the Navy, that we needed to belong to a local church, and we did. And then coming uh, back uh, out of the Navy, back to Greenville, uh, two times living in different sides of Greenville, hunting a church, where should we be? Jacksonville, downtown, 
Jacksonville Beach as Frank I made uh, some rank and we were able to afford a place down at the beach and and etc but hunting a church if you've never had that experience you've really missed out on some things but how do you uh, how do you decide where God wants you uh, to be a member now I, this is not a church growth conference so I won't uh, dig deep in here but you're going to look at the buildings I would think uh, what the curbside look is etc uh, you're going to, uh, to know is it a you know what kind of structure it is how are they keeping up their yards how's, how's the shrubs look uh, when you ride around the building like yours has it got black mold growing on the brick or is it clean uh, how, how, how does it look around uh, the outside appearance and then uh, the, maybe you go to a church and it's a very modest structure or one is gigantic and we belong to uh, some big churches and I won't, I'll quit with that but here it is that you just see the outside uh, you don't really see the inside now if you ride by my house this morning uh, I have got the most beautiful lawn. It is covered, I mean covered in yellow flowers. Uh, and my wife wants me to cut them down. I, 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 they're just so beautiful. Uh, all those yellow dandelions just all over everywhere. They're, they're gorgeous. Now, they might be about that tall, but they're, they're gorgeous. So you ride by my house and you probably would judge me different than what uh, hopefully you would find on the inside etc uh, you you visit those churches and go inside and you may decide uh, that these are very poor people financially or they're very rich people financially uh, there's all kind of things that you will evaluate how friendly they are and boy I learned a lot as director of missions especially when the churches didn't know who I was and I would go in as a guest to just sit in the church and just worship. I learned a lot, boy, how snobbish some Baptists can be and how unwelcome you feel going in. Now, you all are not that way. But uh, it is that we're going to become somewhat judgmental on what we see and what we feel. And what we see and what we feel might not be the reality of that church and so I see that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us as it were an x-ray of the condition of these seven churches to see what's in there now you and Charlie Jones uh, you all are uh, going for those checkups I've got one Tuesday also as a matter of fact uh, me and my wife both may have to have cataract surgery we're getting where we can't see good and uh, especially her boy she can't see a thing but and, uh, but anyhow, she is getting she she's worse, as my dad used to say, than me. I think with this, but both of us uh, we're told are uh, cataract uh, uh, ready uh, for those surgeries, and some of you've had that. But I don't know. But we're going to that Tuesday morning at nine o'clock here at Anderson, and then at two fifteen, I've got to be with uh, Dr. Rickoff in Greenville for a checkup. So we we need that, and many many times it is that we have to have X-rays to reveal what's in here that uh, that they can't see. I've been in those machines where that goes around, you know, makes noise, and I've, uh, one time they thought I might have a brain tumor, and they put me in there and they found out nothing's up here and uh, so uh, you know that already but anyhow uh, it reveals what's internal a and that's important and so now as these seven churches are brought forward in the book of Revelation uh, we see that these are by name so it is to the individual church. There's the message we'll look at in a few moments from Ephesus, then Smyrna, and then Pergamos, Tyathira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are individual congregations, real congregations, real churches. But they're made up of individuals that sit inside 
that congregation. And Paul makes it very clear how we are fitly joined together as a body. And it's important that we function that way. And so uh, this is applied to the churches as a whole, as a unit, but it's also applied to us as individuals who make up the body. And so as we uh, study this, keep in mind that John on the Isle of Patmos, as he uh, penned these things, as the Holy Spirit spoke through him, that he is a pastor at heart. And he comes uh, to encourage these churches in different ways with their specific needs. And, and that's true with every one of us. Uh, we all individually have specific needs. And I certainly discovered as director of missions at all the churches in the Piedmont Baptist Association, they were unique in themselves with unique giftedness and unique assignments in ministry. And the body of that church was made up as individuals. Now, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Revelation 2, 1. This is John's word the Holy Spirit gave to him concerning Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil. And how thou hast tried them that say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. Remember, Therefore, from which you have fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto you quickly, and will remove your candlestick out of its place, except you repent. And this thou hast, that thou hast hated the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now the word Nicolaitans, an old country preacher, I understand, was reading this and he said, he pronounced it nicotine. And he said, I knew the Bible had something to say about nicotine and smoking, <laughs> and here it is. But we'll explain that in a minute if we have time. That's not true. Verse seven, he that hath an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says unto the churches, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Father, uh, thank you so much for uh, all that you have given us in your holy word from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And as you have put in my heart to center in on these seven churches, May you give us an open mind and a heart to hear and give us understanding and application be applied to our own lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, this church at Ephesus has had great leaders. I mean, they, they have had outstanding. There's been Paul, there's been Timothy, and very possibly the Apostle John himself. Uh, you know and I know that uh, some churches begin to worship a pastor more than the Lord. I've, uh, even in some of my pastorates, I have sensed uh, some of that towards me and, and I, absolutely uh, no way. Jesus uh, is the one who is the head of the church and must so remain and so must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. No one else. Period. Jesus and him alone. 
Now, Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit, gave some commendations to this church at Ephesus. In verses 2 and 3, the commendations are uh, that they are a church who is laboring and working and diligent about what they're doing. Uh, they're busy, 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 busy doing the will of God. And so they're commended for this. They're laboring apparently to the very point of exhaustion. I mean, they are working, 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 and working more. And they have patience. Uh, remember that uh, they're under persecution largely in, in much of uh, these areas. And they're patient in it. They're, they're doing good under, under the uh, trial they're enduring. They're carrying on. Uh, and they're working, working, working. As a matter of fact, they're working even though it's tough around them. Uh, they're working through the difficulties and the strain and the restraints of the day. Uh, then the Lord says that not only were they a working church, but they were a doctrinally pure church. Uh, that's a good thing. I am uh, convinced about doctrine. I remember at Fruitland Bible Institute uh, that in class one day, I think it was in theology, uh, that the professor said, put everything off your desk except one blank piece of paper and I want you to start writing down the doctrines of the Bible. Well, what if we did that this morning? Uh, write down the doctrines of the Bible. So I, I sat there with most of the other students just kind of dumbfounded. I, you know, what are the doctrines of the Bible? And I soon learned that he did that for a reason. I soon learned that every truth of God's word is a doctrine. We're scared to death of doctrine, aren't we, usually? Uh, we kind of shy away. Uh, our uh, churches that, uh, you know, have, uh, they just call themselves community or something, and I'm not going to preach against that, but I am going to tell you this. As one preacher said, I'm surely not going into a grocery store and buy cans that have no label on them. Well, I don't know what's in there. Uh, and, you know, but when we put Baptists out there, I, I know what's in that can. Basically, it's uh, different uh, things. You've got to read the ingredients. But, uh, but it is, it's true. But here it is that these people are very concerned about doctrine. They are trying false ministers in verse 2 uh, and, and needs to be. Uh, there needs to be a test. Uh, and if they were found false, they were rejected, and uh, they detected them, they did the study about them, and I've done this in, in a church, or more than one really, but one specifically where a group from the Church of Christ came in, and uh, they were good people, I mean very good people, and they got in, uh, you know, they never joined the church, uh, uh, because they had to go through my new member orientation class and they never made it because uh, they've been discovered about a bunch of stuff. But anyhow, the bottom line is they filtered into the Sunday school class and the first thing I didn't know, we got confusion all over the church doctrinally. And so with my deacons, uh, we made an appointment. I think it was three of us deacons, four of us all together, made an appointment, went to the home of the leader of the group and sat down with them and explained, we are Southern Baptists. And I gave them a, a little pamphlet about the basic doctrinal beliefs of Southern Baptists. And had to sit there with them and say to them, we're not going to convert to Church of Christ doctrine. If you're coming to this church and you are denouncing all of those doctrines that are not what we believe are the truths of God's word, then welcome. But if you're trying to come in and, can, and change us, then not welcome. Find you somewhere else to go. And they did. But anyhow, you have to sometimes uh, be that cautious about all of this. And so you, you move on. 
And this church is commended because of the deeds of the Nicolaitans that they rejected and that they hated. The Nicolaitans were, or actually that word means to conquer, uh, to conquer a people. And apparently, as many scholars seem to say, as I've read after, uh, that this church uh, deemed them to be a religious order who was wanting to lord over the church and rob the people of their liberty in Christ. And apparently out of these Nicolaitans came the doctrine that still filters over into today that we have clergy and we have laity, which you don't find in the Bible. Every one of us that know Jesus Christ, there's level ground at the cross. Now there's different positions that God has assigned us to within his kingdom, within his church, but it's all level. There's no one to lord over anyone else. No group, no one. We're all, every one of us that know Jesus Christ the Savior, have the Holy Spirit of God living in us, and we have equal access to the Father. We have the full uh, equal in his eyes to receive his word and that's why as a pastor and a leader I wanted to hear what everybody had to say. I wanted to know. We would have meetings sometimes just as a family uh, and we'd sit down and discuss these things in a private meeting, no guests, just us and see what God is saying through each and every one of the members of the church. And that we would then, now you gotta be, it's kinda like me and my wife. Uh, she says I don't listen to her, but I do. But I have the final say. Uh-huh, yeah, that's biblical. Now I'm going to listen to her and I'm going to pray with her and I'm going to evaluate what she has to say. But it comes down to it uh, that the head has to be the one to uh, do things. Christ is the head of this church. And, and okay, I'm in trouble with you women. But that's just, that's the way it works. And it's a way to happiness and holiness and goodness of the structure uh, throughout the church is the same thing, but it's on equal ground with us. We just have different positions that God assigns us to. Well, not only the commendations of this church, but here's a blemish. Verse 4, chapter 2. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left what? First love. Do you recall... Uh, your first boyfriend or girlfriend? Well, I do. Her name was Mary. Was in the seventh grade. Oh, my goodness. What a beautiful, blonde-headed girl she was. Oh, my heart just was... I mean, it was swamped. It was even a guy going to fight me over her one time. Uh, because she got sweet on me. And... Uh, I, I remember those days, that petty love stuff, and I, I called her, I finally got her phone number, I called her on the phone, and I didn't know what to say. Remember we had party lines back then, and, and I didn't know who was listening in, and, and, and I, I'm, I called her, and I said, uh, Mary, this has brought us, and she didn't say anything, and I said, Mary, are you a Christian? That's why to start off a good conversation. Well, it was. But, but anyhow, then I want to fast forward on through all of those other little sweethearts and get to the sweetheart of my life. When we met on that blind day, my, 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 she so fell in love with me she wouldn't let me go. I think I've told you that before. That's, that's, and that's not true. It was right the opposite. And I want to tell you what, that first love with that, and, and she's blonde-headed also, and that, that uh, beautiful, blonde-headed, 18-year-old girl, still in Easley High School, and I'm in the Navy, and, and her dad let me date her, the pastor of Jones Avenue Baptist Church, and, and oh my goodness. Now, you know, Frank, that on weekend liberty, you only have such a distance you're supposed to go, and it's not 350 miles, right? So I was AWOL every weekend uh, that I could possibly be off base when the ship was in. 
I'd fill out, leave papers, and lie like a dog when I needed to be off. <laughs> no, not really. I just stretched the truth. But I would, I didn't have any money. I'd thumb home. I can't tell you how many, probably thousands of miles I rode this thumb from Jacksonville, Florida to Greenville, South Carolina so I could get to Easley and spend some time with that gal. And stay to the last minute and then ride my thumb back. I can even tell you an angel story in one of those uh, rides back in no, no time. For, but here it is, that that first love. And I told her, I asked her to marry me along the way. And we dated more through mail than we did in person. But I asked her to marry me. And, and as soon as she got out of high school, and I was getting back. And uh, her dad and mom gave consent. And, and, uh, and, and we, we do, we get married. And oh my, 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 my. I'm telling you, I'd do anything in the world again, Frank, to get off the ship when we were stateside, to get home, to get in that apartment. I did with that wonderful lady that God had gave to me. And our oneness was so close uh, that it seemed like back in those days that she could start to say something and I'd tell her what she wanted. I don't know how that could be. I, but I, one of the great disappointments of my life, and, and it was uh, after church on a Sunday night. She wanted to ice cream cone. We were so broke. I didn't have money to buy her an ice cream cone. Oh. And we, we couldn't get that ice cream cone. Didn't. When she listened to this, she'll still tell me I could, told me I could have found some money somewhere, surely. But anyhow, ah, uh, the bottom line is this, that first love. But they've left it. They're doing all these good things and they're all these good people. But in the midst of all of their business and their activity and, and walking doc, doctrinally pure and everything, somewhere along the way, they've lost that first love for Christ. You remember when you first got saved? Oh my word, what joy, what relief, what, what greatness. I was 10 year old, so... It's not the experience that some of you had in later life when you come to know Christ and you had that forgiveness and that fullness of Christ in you and the love of God swelling in your hearts. So here's some instructions and we'll close with this. Revelation 2.5 Remember, therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works. R. Wow. O-R. What a little word. But what a big meaning. Or else I will come unto you quickly and will remove your candlestick out of his place. Except you repent. First instruction is remember. Uh, memory is a great, great thing. A matter of fact, it, it's going to be a horrible thing in hell. Because when you go to Luke, what is it, 17, and understand uh, that in hell, that the rich man lifted up his eyes, remembered that he had five brothers. Uh, remembering. And you and I both, we all hold memories of things that we wish we could wipe out of our mind. But we remember. And God takes them and he forgives us and he puts them in the seal of forgetfulness. But Satan brings them back to our memory and we, we remember. But here this command is to remember right now. If we've lost the first love individually or collectively as a church to stop and remember, where do we lose it? Remember I preached about that on the axe head a few Sundays ago. You find it where you lost it. I won't revisit that. But the first key is to remember. The second key is to repent. 
When the Holy Spirit of God fingers around in our heart, inside of us, in our mind, in our spirit, and reminds us of where we have walked away from our first love, if we have, repent of it. You know, a first love thing has to be worked at. Do you know that? December 21st, which by the way is winter solstice. Very important day in Alaska. We'll learn what was up there. Very important. Dark 24-7. Up in the upper part. Winter solstice. But on that same day, we will have been married 55 years. Glory to God. But you know what? And I say this with all truthfulness. I love that blonde headed girl more than I've ever loved her in my life today. It's sweeter now than it's ever been. My last visit as a hospice chaplain, very, very last visit, I had about four or five, I had resigned, completed my uh, tenure uh, of uh, staying with them till they found a replacement for me. But my very, very last visit was in Fountain Inn, a nursing home. And Ann went with me that day just to spend the day with me. And she sat in a car and I went in. And it was an old retired preacher and his wife. And I'd been visiting with him for a long time. And when I walked into the room, uh, she, was, I, she was already, for the whole time, uh, unable to really talk. But he was. But now he can't hardly talk. And when I walked into the room, she was, as she usually was, laying back off of the chair she was sitting in, the recliner, uh, with her head laid way back. And he was in his recliner. They were in the room together. And uh, he was kind of in the same position. They're asleep. So I had to awaken at least him. And so I stood there and I prayed over them. And it's my last, last visit as a hospice chaplain. And finally, the old preacher that I'd learned to love so much, I reached down and tugged on his shoulder, shaking him. And he awakened. And he looked up at me. And he hollered out, Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Is it lunchtime? Is it lunchtime? Scared me by half out of my wits. And then his next words was this as he's trying to find his watch to look at. He said, he saw me and he recognized me. And he said, oh, oh, but preacher, at least we're still here. At least we're still here. So me and my wife, like this morning, when I got her coffee ready, so it's a very delicate formula of she likes a little bit of coffee with her cream and all the stuff. And, and I've got it down to a science. She's even written it down in case I died that she can do the same thing. But when I go in and awaken her, usually I say to her, Morning, baby girl. And she'll move and open her eyes. And I say, Well, at least we're still here. It's become a household thing with us. At least we're still here. Just me and you, Mama, I remind her. And usually, like this morning, we sit down for a few minutes, but usually it's an hour and a half to two hours we sit and just enjoy one another. Pray together. Talk. It's sweet. It's good. But it's got to be worked at. It don't just happen if you don't work at it. That goes for both. And it's the same with our Lord Jesus Christ. 
our love relationship with him has to be worked at. He's got to be put first above everything and spend time with him. I try to do that. I'm not, I, I don't want to sound anything, but it's just reality that I love to go in in the quietness of the morning and spend time with my Savior. Just having a love relationship. Sometimes this communication is not even in words. Just communicating. Love relationship. Wow, I've got goosebumps. I want to tell you. That's what it's all about. Loving Christ. And loving him supremely. Loving him first. If that's not true of you as an individual, you need to remember and need to repent. Oh, and I didn't even get to this. Y'all got another hour? Uh, what did, what is it, what's the last words here? I'm going to go back to that real quick. What's the last, what's the very last words? Uh, oh, that's a whole other sermon. <laughs> what's the last words here? Oh, do. You remember, you repent, but you know what? If you don't start doing what you've repented of, doing that that creates the first love. Whatever you've repented of, you that means you turn from it. And then we start doing what we need to do in that first love. Father, thank you. God, I, I trust I've been clear with what you put in my heart. And we know churches that love you, lift up Jesus, you draw people on to that group. I've seen it over the years. But God, we know that we're, we don't have that first love that's experienced between Christ and us. And we know that if we have that, that we've repented and we've returned to that first love with you, Lord, that we cannot help but love one another and accept one another and work together even in disagreement to love one another and to serve you. So Father, thank you. And Lord, on this invitation, draw us unto yourself. In the name of Jesus, amen.